Hey folks, uh, John Becker here, State Representative, Claremont County, House District 65, bringing to you another update regarding the impeachment of Governor Mike DeWine. So actually, uh, three things I want to talk to you about uh, this week, uh, very briefly. First off has to do with, um, well actually all three of these were in the uh, Cincinnati Enquirer this week. First one I want to talk to you about, this is from the September 18th, uh, 2020 edition, the and the headline is Vitriol Scares Off Health Officials. And it has to do with a candidate, uh, Joan, maybe I'm pronouncing this wrong, du, Duve? Duve? Uh, D U W V E. My apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I believe she's from South Carolina. And uh, she was named to be the director of the Ohio uh, Department of Health. Okay, so she withdrew her name at the last minute for uh, unsure exactly what all was behind the scenes, the reasons behind it, but part of the information that came out is that she was an activist with Planned Parenthood, and the governor knew about this before he selected her. He also knew, I mean the governor, also knew about Amy Acton being an activist with the Obama campaign and also being pro-abortion. So it begs the question, why is a so-called pro-life Republican putting somebody who's pro-abortion in these enormously powerful positions, such as the Department of Health, the Director of Public Health. So why would somebody pro-abortion do, do that? Or, I'm sorry, why would somebody pro-life appoint somebody who is pro-abortion to a position like that? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but it does remind me of some problems we have in the Republican Party, and it has to do with the vetting of, uh, of elected officials and candidates that uh, maybe the pro-life uh, groups need to get better at, and I'm not sure what the answer to this is, but the, the problem is that you have uh, candidates that will claim to be pro-life, and uh, they'll know what to say to the pro-lifers, and they will know, you know how to check the boxes on, on, on the surveys, and they get everything right, but then when the rubber hits the road, you find out, well, they're really not as pro-life as they said. I mean, uh, we, you know, I remember an, an example not too long ago where you had a candidate who, uh, who was claiming to be pro-life, and I uh, believe this person. You know, we had some differences of opinion on some issues, but uh, I believe this person to be pro-life, very, very authentic. And then it turned out uh, that, uh, well, she, evidence was uh, created or produced that she had her own abortion. And uh, this was, uh, you know, recently, not like it happened, you know, 30 years ago or something. But uh, actually, yeah, I guess it was after, the, after she was no longer a candidate. So, you know, th these things are very sad when they happen. And, uh, it, you know, sometimes you just don't know what you're getting into with the different candidates. And now it begs the question with Governor DeWine. Is he uh, really pro-life or is he not? And uh, evidence such as, you know, creating a, uh, or, or installing or selecting a, a Department of, of Public Health um, uh, director to be the to be a pro-abortion uh, uh, activist is, is is very disturbing. So also uh, in this week's paper, this was uh, so there's two other articles here from uh, September the 19th. So first one has to do with um, the governor is allowing uh, the president President uh, Trump to have a campaign without uh, using masks. So you know, under First Amendment rights. So this is a victory. So the governor is uh, backing down a, a little bit, allowing some First Amendment rights on, on uh, uh, not requiring people to wear masks. So, so that's, uh, that, that's progress. So also, in the same newspaper, talks about DeWine signs bill curtailing his powers with elections. And this is referring to House Bill 272. And the article talks about how, um, you know, he can no longer interfere with an election and he cannot close churches. Okay, so let's talk about that. I've got the bill in front of me, and uh, I've done a careful analysis on what exactly the bill says and what it doesn't say, what it appears to do and, and, and doesn't do. So first off, it, uh, I'm looking at line number 15, and it refers to section 9.57, and this language sounds good initially. Notwithstanding any contrary provision of the revised code, no public official shall issue an order to close all places of worship in the state or in a geographic area of the state. Okay. So, well, first off, the governor has never closed churches in Ohio, nor has he threatened to do so. But it says the key word here is close all places of worship. It doesn't say you can't restrict. 
So based on this bill, there's frankly, there's no reason why the governor can't, uh, you know, limit people going to churches to say, you know, 15% of capacity, uh, you know, maybe only one person in the building at a time. He can make up any, any uh, limits that, that, uh, he, that he wants to and not be in violation of this law because he's not closing the building. He's only saying one person at a time could be in the building. So I question kind of the value of, uh, uh, you know, the, this language. I mean, is it helpful? Does it move the ball in the right direction? Yeah, but it's marginal. So, you know, I would call that more feel-good legislation anything else. But let's get to something more interesting. So also in the same bill, you get uh, down to line 71, and it uh, creates a section 3501.40. And the language uh, looks pretty interesting at first blush, except as permitted under Section 16109 of the Revised Code, and notwithstanding any other contrary provision of the Revised Code, no public official shall cause an election to be conducted other than in the time, place, and manner prescribed by the Revised Code. Okay, that all sounds fine and good. However, there's a bit of a problem with this. So when you go back to the March primary, and the governor closed all the polling locations. He, you know, he effectively canceled the election. So, so a couple of problems here. It is illegal for the governor to cancel or reschedule an election. Okay, under current law, without regard to this bill, this bill just really doubles down on the language of what is currently, you know, in, in the Constitution and in the Ohio Revised Code. Only the General Assembly can can schedule and determine how an election works. So. The governor claims, and his people claim, the people supporting the governor would say, oh, no, 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 no. The governor didn't cancel an election. He didn't reschedule an election. All he did was close all the polling locations so that nobody could vote that day. That's different from canceling an election. That's just closing all the polling locations so nobody can vote. Okay, well, I'm not sure how that's different from canceling an election, but that's, a, but that's a, the argument they're using. So my question is, based on this new language that I just read to you, how does that stop the Ohio Department of Health from closing all of the polling locations so nobody can vote? I mean, that's not canceling an election, according to them. It's just closing the polling locations with the health, the health department has the authority to do, according to them. So, again, I question the value of this legislation. You know, is it moving the ball down to court? On that particular issue, I don't think so. It really doesn't look like it because it doesn't affect or doesn't change where the problem is. And, and the problem is in a piece of code, and I talked about this in the last video, which I did last week, it's a 3701.13, where, where in that uh, uh, code, that's where the health department is finding this authority that uh, you know, they can take dictatorial powers and shut down as much of the state as they want to shut down and control things with a wrecking ball. This, so this, none of this, this, this bill does not affect that section of the code at all, and that section of the code is the problem. Now, if you want to see a bill that does impact that section of the code and does have some teeth in it, look up House Bill 618. That's the bill that I wrote. That bill goes directly after 370113, and it changes that section of the code. That bill has teeth in it. That bill guarantees there cannot be any shutting down of churches or shutting down of elections or any of the crazy stuff that the governor has been doing unless it is first approved by the General Assembly. So anyway, let's keep the pressure on folks. I can tell you it is working. The, uh, you know, so the governor did, uh, did sign this bill and to some minimal extent at least, it appears to cur curtail some of his power of which he had previously pledged that he would veto anything that curtails his power. So I guess he figured whatever curtailing this does, it's pretty minimal. And uh, that's frankly, that is my read on it as well. It's pretty minimal, if, if, if any. But I am hearing from my colleagues that they are getting pressure from you all. So that's a good thing. I would, uh, I would encourage you to keep that up and let, you, let uh, your state representative know that, uh, you know, hey, they're up for re-election in November and you would like to enthusiastically vote for them and to help you to enthusiastically vote for them, co-sponsor the bill or co-sponsor co the resolution to impeach Governor DeWine. And you can find those articles of impeachment at impeachdewine.com, impeachdewine.com. Com. So contact your state representative, be polite, be nice, ask them to co-sponsor. And the key word is co-sponsor, because if you just say support, that's different. Because 
because the bill has or the resolution has not been introduced yet. So there, there, there is really nothing in the House to consider. It's just in draft mode. And the reason it's in draft mode is because it's open ended and allowing for my colleagues to sign on as co-sponsors. Once I submit it to the clerk's office, once it's actually in the House, you know, subject to uh, getting assigned to a committee, that closes the window on additional co-sponsors. And then they can say, oh no, I, you know, it's too late to co-sponsor the bill, it's already been submitted, you know, we'll have to see, blah, 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 blah. So at this point, it's not too late. Hold their feet to the fire, tell them to co-sponsor it. And, and, you know, tell them you would like to vote for them enthusiastically, but you vote for them regardless, please. I, you know, I, I want you to go out and vote for every Republican all up and down the ticket, all the way from president down to dog catcher. So please do that in November. Uh, you know, vote absentee uh, is what uh, I recommend. It's, uh, you know, it's safe to do. Uh, so please do that if you're more comfortable going to the polling location, as long as the governor doesn't shut it down again, which apparently he can do, because whatever authority he used last time, that authority is still in place. And this particular bill I just read to you, House Bill 272, that bill doesn't even go into effect for 90 days. So that would be after this election, assuming it had any teeth in it that would stop him from closing all the polling locations like he did the last time. And again, the bill doesn't even address that. So I really think it's uh, just feel good legislation more than anything else. So again, this is John Becker, state representative from uh, Claremont County. That's this week's update. And uh, y'all have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.